as we are all very aware in our own personal context, Europe has been hit by a series of crises since the turn of the century. These have been financial crises, political crises, and we are now living through a global public health crisis. Now, the common consequence of all of these crises is the deep personal impact, the impact of which may not easily be recovered from. In fact, life amid crisis has become the new normal, even if that new normal can depend on different circumstances and different crises. The COVID-19 crisis, beyond its terrible human impact, has caused a series of global shocks, plummeting uh, demand and supply of goods and services, uh, economic turmoil and financial market crash. Measures to contain the pandemic have hit key sectors, including tourism and hospitality, just as manufacturing trade and production has plummeted. This has meant, in real terms, significant job losses. In 2020, this has essentially deepened socioeconomic equalities and inequalities in the EU. In real terms, despite safety nets, um, the unemployment rate in Europe is expected to rise to 9% and real disposable income is expected to fall by 1%. What the measures that have been adopted to combat and to tackle the pandemic have caused in real terms is the most negative impacts to fall on the most vulnerable populations in society. This includes the elderly, refugees, minorities and other very vulnerable populations. The sudden mass unemployment of casual workers and part-time workers, along with the sudden onset of a lack of childcare and schooling, has meant that it has disproportionately negatively impacted women. For example, we need to look at the many deep crises that are continuing to affect, because as we know, the current crisis has followed several. To create an effective response, to be resilient to crisis, we must look at the cumulative effect of all of these crises. Because as the most devastating social impacts are often those which arise not from a single moment, a single issue, but from the cumulative effect of unresolved, unaddressed and deeply critical issues that have arisen as a consequence of all of these crises. Following the financial crash and the financial crisis, the erosion of living standards has left households vulnerable in long periods of lockdown to reduced income and unemployment. This has reinforced feelings of distrust towards politics and towards democratic institutions and their capacity to correctly and aptly and ably address crisis. Even prior to the pandemic, we have seen the rise of highly polarised discourse and political discourse and the increasing rejection of some of rule of law and democratic norms. Extreme uncertainty as regards the future can serve to undermine confidence in politics and the capacity of democracies to respond to crisis. At the same time, this current context highlights the urgency to find innovative solutions, innovative projects, innovative ideas that can enable us to create citizen-centric responses, citizen-centric responses that can help us to build an economic and European resilience to this crisis. This is the kind of thing that we are looking at in the projects today. Because at the same time, this current situation, this new normal, this new world that is being exposed and evolving before our eyes has brought opportunities for new skills, new capabilities, new technologies, which together with research and innovation can enable us to build a better future, one that is far better than our pre-COVID past. Only by moving forward together can we rebuild this European resilience? Can we rebuild this, this Europe? And can we build a better and stronger European Union built on those fundamental principles of solidarity, of democracy, of the rule of law, and ultimately trust? How Europe acts now in response to so successive a series of crises 
will determine the future of Europe. With this in mind, uh, our aim today in this session is to reflect on some of the findings of the absolutely fantastic projects that have been funded by Horizon 2020. Some of these projects are completed and some of these projects are still ongoing. And I am delighted to introduce you to some of our fantastic experts. So hello and welcome to Professor Christian Lawson. Can I also uh, can I also uh, say hello to Professor Bridget Laffin, to Professor Bridget, oh, to Professor Martin Lodge, and we have two fantastic blank screens, which at some point will reveal further fantastic experts that are going to be joining us today. So there are so many things to talk about, um, but first, can I pass over to Professor Christian Lausen? So, Professor, yeah. hello, hello and welcome. Hello, Joel, thanks for being here. Thank you for joining us, thank you for joining us. So, Professor Lawson, you have coordinated the project TransSol, which looks at transnational solidarity in a times of crisis, and you're also coordinating a second and fundamentally important project, and trust, which together with Parisa and Tigre will provide novel insights into trust and distrust in both governance and experts, and also measures to support sustainable and democratic societies in Europe. Now, both are highly complicated and multi-dimensional multi phenomena, but let's get down to a very important question. So the different crises and crises in Europe seem to have placed solidarity at the top of both public and policy agendas. Now, how have citizens' initiatives reacted to these different crises? Essentially, is solidarity inclusive or exclusive? Well, thanks, Joel. Um, uh, trends of findings show that European citizens are highly supportive of solidarity and actively engaged, even if public debates uh, nowadays rather suggest a backlash um, of xenophobic and uh, right-wing populism on the rise. However, this does not mirror what the silent majority does and thinks. Um, two lessons can be drawn from our year-long research work in the field of disabilities, unemployment, and migration. First, citizens are stepping up their activities in times of crisis. We even can say citizens and civic groups are Europe's fire brigade because they react immediately to upcoming hardships in absence of concerted policies at the national and European level. Now, the second lesson we can learn from our research is uh, we were indeed expecting conflicts between exclusive national inward-looking solidarity against an open European or cosmopolitan solidarity. But the dividing line is very different. It is rather between people who are not committed and not engaged in solidarity whatsoever, and very often we here have a right-wing populist, and those engaged in solidarity. So this means that um, survey analysis of our um, research in eight countries show that people who are active in local and national solidarity activities are more likely to be also engaged in European supranational solidarity. So the, uh, the call of our times is nurture solidarity and you will nurture European solidarity. Wonderful, wonderful recommendation. But just to push you now to the question of trust, and this is your second project that you're coordinating. Very impressive. With regard to your ongoing research, how have trust dynamics changed during the crisis? What, what lessons can we learn from the current situation? Well, we just have started, so we are relying on available data and research, and this shows that Crises do not necessarily threaten trust in governance. It is rather bad performance that is clearly detrimental. So I'm speaking of mismanagement, of corruption, of lack of accountability. And this is evidenced by current surveys on the COVID-19 pandemic mix because you have countries where trust is quite stable because governments are doing their job. 
So in regard to drivers and dynamics, we want to highlight that trust in government governance is highly dependent on trust in experts and the mass media. And that's why our three projects, Perizia coordinated by Maria Bagramian, Tigre coordinated by Martino Maggetti and Entrust, will pay particular attention to political governments, experts, and the mass media. So we are interested in feedback loops and potential spillover effects. Now, just let me highlight one thing which we think is key. The key question is not trust, it's optimum levels of trust. It might be true that during the current crisis, trust in experts and political institutions is a matter of life and death. However, in general, uncritical trust is not the goal because we need to prevent citizens from distrusting, from trusting untrustworthy politicians and autocrats, false expertise, fake news, or conspiracy theories. So in this regard, the three projects will inquire not only into the condition of trust, but basically also in optimum levels of trust. Again, critical words. Trust experts, but don't place trust blindly. I am delighted now to welcome all of our speakers. Could we pass over to Professor Sergio Salvatore? So Professor Salvatore, you coordinated the project Recreere. Its purpose was to study what kind of social identity change is happening within European societies in order to bring recommendations as to how to approve the efficiencies of policies operating in and for the sake of citizens, especially in a crisis scenario. So within the project, you have identified what you've called symbolic universes. First, what is a symbolic universe? And then how important are these symbolic universes to understand the changes that are ongoing within societies? Uh, good morning. Um, so what, is, what are symbolic universes? Symbolic universes are uh, deep worldview, the way through which we uh, see and interpret life. They are both rational and uh, emotional. For example, a symbolic universe is uh, to see life as a jungle, society as a jungle, or another symbolic universe is, is uh, that life has a, an inner, inner order. Uh, symbolic universes so are something like a lens from which we see everything, and so we shape, uh, shape our behavior, our feeling, our way of thinking, and uh, also our uh, decision making. Uh, so symbolic universes are a kind of link, a bridge between individuals, uh, other people, institutions, and they also ground the feeling of uh, life, uh, the sense of the present of, and of future. We have uh, many data that uh, allied, we have collected through the project many data that allied um, all symbolic universes in, uh, uh, strong impact both at the uh, individual level, for example, perception of, of, on personality, uh, ways, uh, way of thinking, uh, way of, the, the cognitive way of thinking, also at the social level, for example, attitude uh, towards forums, and also at political level, for example, we have found a relation between symbolic universes and Brexit, decision on Brexit referendum and uh, behavior vote. So symbolic universes have a matter in uh, society. Again, fascinating. But let's, let's pick up a bit on this, this idea of symbolic universes as influencing the way we see things and influencing the way that we understand things. So what role then does culture play when designing and implementing policies to face challenges that any and all crises pose? So symbolic universes is the, uh, the deep dimension of culture. Culture is, uh, according to our point of view, culture is the way people interpret the, the context, so the social uh, life, uh, the political scenario, and so on. Uh, there is a, 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 also 
a huge number of studies in the last 20 years that uh, uh, highlight that culture is relevant for policy because given that culture uh, influence the way people think also the culture influence policy but however in, uh, in spite of this culture uh, is not uh, taken in, into account uh, in a very relevant way by policy making in the concrete situation of policy of intervention somehow uh, policy makers uh, think uh, we have found that policy maker Policymakers tend to think to policy in terms of the problems they have to address, not of the people that is involved in the view of the problem and that, that mediate, that is through the uh, policymaker and the problems. So uh, uh, culture has something that has also to uh, be developed in the uh, sensibility of policymakers uh, to take into account it. This area is even, this point is even more relevant now uh, with, after the COVID-19 uh, uh, impact, because the more uncertain and uncertainty, the more uncertainty, the more uh, culture became a relevant point, because uh, somehow the way of uh, seeing life change and from which the way of addressing problems uh, change. And so we need to uh, manage the impact of culture on uh, policy. Exactly, exactly. Another fascinating insight. We do need to make that connection. And now let me welcome uh, Professor Ides Nikesa. Uh, you coordinated the Reinvest project. It's an uh, approach focused on contributing to a more powerful, feasible and inclusive social investment strategy, concentrating on human rights and strengthening and the strengthening of both individual and collective capabilities. I'm very excited to talk about this project. So it may be said that the vulnerable end up paying would you say that this has been true, that you've observed this to be true in the crises that you have studied? It's always the case, unfortunately, that uh, the poor are the first victims of every crisis uh, because they work in the most uh, uh, flexible and vulnerable segments of the labor market, uh, the catering sector, uh, the retail sector, construction industry, etc. Um, but people tend to think that uh, once uh, the employment crisis is over, everything is back to normal. In this particular case, I think the poor were hit uh, three times as hard, uh, not just because of the loss of employment uh, and, uh, it must be said, also uh, economies in social protection, uh, savings on social protection, uh, that resulted in lower benefits and more uh, people being excluded from benefits. Uh, but also because that, um, that uh, crisis um, broke out in the financial sector and uh, the real estate sector. And the financial sector uh, in crisis meant that uh, conditions for borrowing uh, were severely tightened and that uh, people who were indebted uh, could no longer get access to credit. So many uh, hundreds of thousands of families got into a severe uh, debt crisis and hundreds of thousands, not to say millions, uh, lost their homes. And so there was soaring uh, homelessness and uh, severe debt crisis. And what is uh, worst of all, um, I think uh, we must conclude that uh, policies um, were actually exacerbating um, the situation rather than uh, uh, remedying it because the harsh um, austerity policies uh, that were conducted in Europe, uh, sometimes encouraged or even imposed by the European Commission, um, I, I'm thinking of the, the, the pigs countries and the, um, the over-indebted countries, um, those, those austerity policies um, have, um, uh, have uh, triggered um, yeah, lasting, uh, not to say irreversible damage. I take the example of Healthcare uh, economies on healthcare uh, in Romania, for example, have resulted in a massive outflow of healthcare workers. 
And today, with COVID crisis, there's a severe shortage of health uh, uh, pro uh, services in Romania. So this is a lasting effect uh, more than 10 years after the outbreak of the previous crisis. And the same happens at the individual level. And we have collected evidence of people uh, dropping out from school, for example, because they wanted to supplement the family income, of patients uh, that uh, stopped taking their medication because uh, uh, it was uh, it had become unaffordable, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, the crisis not only had temporary, but it had a lasting damage uh, for the poorest. Are your projects. So they almost in response to it, advocates a social investment strategy. What is this? How would you recommend it? Yes, um, the aim of the project was to underpin with uh, conceptual and empirical work um, the so-called social investment package that was launched by the European Commission uh, back in 2013. It was a sort of revamping of social policies. Now, that um, package was very interesting and, and voluntaristic, um, but it uh, also had a serious economic connotation. And uh, that was also a criticism that was um, yeah, put forward by a number of, of, um, of uh, intellectuals. Um, actually, we, we tried to uh, extend the definition of um, uh, social investment to a more humanistic and uh, from a, a sort of economistic cost-benefit um, approach to investing in people, in their employability, towards a more humanistic and multidimensional uh, definition. Um, and we used the capabilities approach of Amartya Sen because uh, Amartya Sen um, is, say, the founding father of that multidimensional idea of welfare, which is um, reflected in people's capabilities. It means that people not only um, are producers, uh, are workers in a, in a labor market, but they are also, they have a family life, they participate in social life, and all these different dimensions, uh, being healthy, um, are considered part um, and parcel of a welfare concept. So uh, investing in people is investing basically in their basic social rights and in their capabilities at large, not just for the labor market, but for life at large. And the same applies in the opposite direction. So you can also disinvest in people. And that is what happened with the previous crisis. And disinvesting in education, in healthcare, in public housing, etc., uh, meant also that in some cases, uh, people's uh, fundamental rights, uh, a right to a decent health uh, system, uh, to affordable health care, a right to education, a right to uh, shelter, to housing, were violated. So um, uh, social investment also has a flip side uh, with social disinvestment. And the, the main lesson that we draw for um, uh, future uh, anti-crisis policies is that uh, such social investment approaches uh, must be backed by a systematic uh, social impact analysis. Uh, we must uh, bear in mind that every measure not just has a direct impact, but can have a lasting indirect impact on people. And that's and whenever critical, I such, think, to uh, then understand sorry. that that's, that's critical. That's the critical point, that social investment seems to be the way through crisis, certainly not social divestment or disinvestment in crisis or outside of crisis. Just on the same topic, exactly. I think we need to pass over to Bridget Laffin. So Bridget Laffin taking a slightly different view on this. So Professor Laffin, you are currently coordinating in Dev EU, a project aimed at co uh, contributing to the current debate on the future of Europe by assessing, developing and testing a range of models and scenarios for different levels of integration among EU member states. Now, integrating diversity in the European Union is high on the EU agenda as the EU strives to forge a post-crisis future and reach out to European citizens to counterbalance the anti-EU populist discourse. Now, with this in mind, big question, does a differentiated integration approach strengthen democratic legitimacy in the European Union? So whenever the 
whenever the EU talks about its future, uh, differentiated integration is inevitably on the agenda. And differentiated integration is integration that involves most but not all member states. So one of the things we do in our project is we're building a database of all uses of differentiated integration from 1958 to now in two forms, internal differentiation within the uh, EU and external differentiation relations with third countries. And this will allow us uh, really drill down into the scope conditions for uh, differentiated integration and their consequences over time, which then helps us answer that central question you asked. Does differentiation, is it an answer in terms of uh, strengthening the democratic fabric of the EU? And of course, the answer is it depends. In other words, it depends on how it is used. If def differentiated integration becomes a form of two-tier Europe, then that won't strengthen the EU democratically. But if it becomes if it remains open, in other words, that countries can join when they want to and when they are able to, it will and does strengthen uh, the democratic quality of the EU because it allows for diversity, flexibility and that avoidance of one size fits all. But I would say that it really is important for the for the EU that it remains, that the consensus remains as large as possible over time. Why? I give you the example of the recent uh, COVID recovery fund. There was a lot of debate that that fund might be based on corona bonds within the Eurozone, but COVID hit all EU member states. So it was better for the system and also in terms of uh, the, the democracy within the system, that the response was EU-wide. It was a response of the 27 and the recovery fund. And given what we've heard on social investment and uh, on, on the inequalities, then had that recovery fund only been in the Eurozone, I think that would have been an example of differentiated integration that doesn't strengthen the, the democratic fabric of the system. Certainly, absolutely certainly. And just picking up on this point, so then is differentiated integration, is this response, could it reconcile these two very opposing camps of nationalist and globalist? Is, is this the way forward, the way through? Well, I, I think when we look at the demand for differentiation, the demand tends not to come from the radical right for whom, uh, for whom the EU is problematic in everything it does. In other words, they're strongly Eurosceptic and perhaps in some instances one could define them as Europhobic. The demand for differentiated integration comes from two sources. One, where the preferences of a country are not aligned with what the, mo what the majority of the EU want to go do and the way they want to go. Uh, and the other is when countries are simply not ready. But I think there is another uh, distinction that we see now in the EU, and that's because of Brexit, that Brexit has sharpened the distinction between differentiation within the EU and external differentiation. So the UK was the champion of differentiated integration. It was the country with most opt-outs. But it has found that once it has become a third country, that External differentiation is very different in terms of power dynamics and relationships than internal differentiation. And perhaps we will see, but it's too early to tell, that with the departure of the UK, differentiated integration becomes weakens within the EU, but becomes more significant in relations between the EU and its neighbourhood.
This is certainly the critical issue, how to connect. And on the point of connecting, I'd now like to talk or connect with Professor Jan Wouters. Uh, hi, Jan, welcome to the program. So my question okay. is, uh, welcome, Jan. So, Professor Vouters, you are the coordinator of ReConnect, uh, an ongoing project focusing on strengthening the EU's legitimacy through democracy and the rule of law. The project seeks to build a new narrative for Europe, aimed at enabling the European Union to become more attuned to the expectations of its citizens. Now, the critical question here is, well, what are the main problems that are with reconnecting the citizens with the European Union and how may these be overcome? Well, we are witnessing a growing distrust towards European institutions and the institutions are often seen as unable or even unwilling to truly respond to the concerns of citizens. And that has created a disconnect between the Union and its citizens that has become the target of a new wave of populism. And some problems are particularly salient. And if I may, I would like to highlight three of them. First of all, the democratic disconnect. When the EU and the European communities were created, efficiency was prioritized over citizen participation. And despite some very important reforms in the past, the EU remains ill-equipped to respond to demands for greater legitimacy and responsiveness to the hopes and concerns of its citizens. And so ReConnect research points to three key ways in which the EU can respond to these challenges. First, making full use of democratic elements, such as the European Parliament elections. We witness overall decreasing turnout rates across Europe, and that withdrawal from public participation is one of the most worrying signs of the growing distance between citizens and their EU representatives. And here, small changes can have a significant effect. For example, holding concurrent national and European elections. Secondly, creating new tools and channels for citizen participation are really going to be vital. Tools that inform citizens about the union are crucial because many citizens still lack awareness of what is at stake in European elections. And without a basic understanding of the EU, citizen engagement will always be constrained. But finding new ways of engaging with citizens is really essential, especially when the current channels, such as the Citizens Initiative, do not really have a direct impact on decision making. And the Conference on the Future of Europe, which we hope will kick off soon, has actually a great potential, but it will only succeed if greater efforts are going to be made at bringing the EU closer to European citizens. And last but not least, speaking of this democratic disconnect, the EU must find better ways of living up to its fundamental values, which, as you know, include democracy and the rule of law, but also pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality all of which are currently under pressure across the EU and its member states. There is a, a second uh, disconnect, if I may, that's the rule of law disconnect. Rule of law backsliding has entrenched inequalities among European citizens who do not always enjoy the same political and civil liberties. They cannot all rely on a just and effective judicial system, or they live in a society um, that is um, sometimes really um, affected by widespread corruption. So Reconnect research suggests that here too the EU can strengthen the rule of law by using the current instruments in the EU toolbox much more promptly, forcefully and in a coordinated manner. But also the EU should improve existing tools. Think of the activation of the Article 7 procedure, the so-called nuclear device, but make that a kind of default position in case of non-compliance of a member state with rule of law recommendations made by the European Commission, or invite more contributions from civil society when the Commission is, is issuing recommendations to member states. Thirdly, here too on the rule of law uh, disconnect, I think it's important to broaden the mandate of existing key EU bodies. 
such as the Fundamental Rights Agency in Vienna, the European Anti-Fraud Office, as well as the newly established European Public Prosecutor's Office, so that they really have the tools to sanction rule of law backsliding and the reduction of democratic pluralism and to uphold fundamental values, also when it comes to EU structural and cohesion funds. There's a last disconnect, which I would call a crisis disconnect. Over the past years, as we have seen, Europe has witnessed numerous crises, from the financial crisis to the migration crisis, and most recently the health crisis caused by COVID-19. And in these crises, citizens tend to look forward to a union that protects them, which is not always forthcoming. Rather than demonstrating preparedness and decisive and coordinated action, the union fails in the eyes of its citizens to protect them from serious threats. Concrete steps need to be taken to build a real European health union. Acting on President von der Leyen's pledge in her State of the Union address last week, effective burden sharing and coordination on migration are necessary in order to defend the idea of Europe and ensure that its fundamental values will become a reality for all. Exactly, exactly, that this is such a fundamental aspect beyond and immediately reconnecting citizens, its investment, its integration, it's all of these key recommendations that these projects are bringing. Now, moving to our last speaker, and this is the real critical and immediate insights that we can take from this. Professor Martin Lodge, you have been the coordinator of Trans Crisis. Now, this, pro uh, this project focused uh, with different approaches on understanding crisis management capabilities across institutions within a multi-level governance setting, critical for the current situation that we are now facing. So you've been working on political leadership and attitudes and approaches for when facing crisis. What kind of attitudes have you seen? Actually, more importantly, more critically, what kind of attitude or approach would be needed by European leaders in addressing the current crisis? Well, when we started with TransCrisis, it was all about the financial crisis and the EU. Uh, when, as TransCrisis continued, we had the refugee crisis, we had Brexit, uh, we had problems um, constitutionally with Hungary as well as in Spain. So we had plenty of um, transboundary crises in many different ways. And um, I think the project didn't try to say we have one particular approach. But I think what, what one can say is that the lesson from the financial crisis was that um, there was too much reliance, you could argue, on having a single problem definition, such as you know, life is a moral hazard problem and therefore the solutions emerge. So I think what, what one can say also when one sort of takes this project's finding, trans-crisis findings forward to the present context, I think political leadership is ultimately about sort of um, considering a set of tasks which we identified from detection to sense-making to communication and such like. But it really is also at the time of sense-making about two uh, fundamental questions in political leadership, uh, and that is at all levels and of organizations. So one is, um, do you want to err on the side of caution or do you want to sort of err on the you know, side of my, my core resilience? Um, and the second one is, uh, how pluralistic do you want to be in your problem definition? Are you open for immediate feedback processes in that you can reverse uh, your opinion? And I think that is uh, sort of the critical path for political leadership. The other second key lesson, I would say, which we found across all these projects, is the importance of um, political leadership understanding, um, an understanding of political leadership, which uh, understands governing in Europe as a multi-level system rather than as a centralized system which either relies on national or EU level responses. Again, critical, critical, important insights that we can almost adopt immediately. So my question now would be, it seems, at least in the current experience, that the EU is not designed to rapidly respond to crisis and unexpected situations. This limitation is already readily apparent in the last six to, well, and longer than that, the last decade. But critically the last six months. What challenges do transboundary crises pose for current systems of governance and especially the European Union? 
I mean, I think we can sort of distinguish both between the immediate response, let's call it like that, to which I'll come to in a second, but also the ongoing management. So what we found in our research was that ultimately crisis, transboundary crisis management in the EU is not just about crisis rooms uh, somewhere in Brussels or in national or sub-national uh, ministries and departments and such like. There's fundamentally a, a, a challenge or a conflict across you know, whether one looks at financial regulation, whether one looks at sort of environmental areas, about sort of two questions. One is, where is ultimately competence um, allocated? So is this a question of the EU coordinating ultimately national and subnational authorities in charge, or is authority, comp legal competence, moving to the EU level? And the second key part is really about the a question about how much discretion exists at the front line. Um, and, and across all crisis management regimes we focused on, which ranged from finance to social policy to, to the environment to infrastructure, we found exactly these kind of two conflict lines emerging, that there was a, a fundamental problem, which also affects on the question of legitimacy, as previous uh, speakers have highlighted, between sort of who should be in charge and who would citizens like to be in charge. So would you know a citizen in one area of Germany like to be switched off by someone, some European agency elsewhere? And that has struck us as potentially raising substantial legitimacy problems. So for the EU, uh, I think this means um, it is unlikely to be sort of the, let's call it the political first responder when it comes to transboundary crisis. So what it can do is ultimately be a coordinator. It can coordinate, um, uh, you might say, in anticipatory ways, so establish, you might say, protocols and such like for some degree of uh, consistent joint action, for having resources available to offer some kind of solidarity. And then I would argue it is also the place when, let's call it the acute crisis of has passed and you might say the new normal in whatever sense it has established to establish basically consistency between member states and so on. Uh, I, I suspect given the prevalence of national politics at the EU level is uh, least likely to be the right place or you know, the, the place that national politicians will go to when it comes to crisis responses in the immediate context of an acute crisis. Certainly, certainly. Now, as I'm aware that we only have a few minutes left, can I just thank our wonderful experts for joining us today? Professor Sergio Salvatore, Professor Christian Lawson, Professor Ides Nikesa, Professor Jan Vautos, Professor Bridget Laffin, and Professor Martin Lodge. Can I also urge everyone watching right now, all of these incredible projects, these incredible recommendations and findings and amazing research that is coming out of the European Union is available right now online. You can look it up immediately as soon as the session is over. Look it up. It's incredible. But uh, as I thank all our speakers and look forward to our next uh, fantastic speaker joining us, we have the Deputy De Director General for Research and Innovation, Signorazzo, who's going to close this session. Welcome and over to you. <laughs> Many, many thanks. Uh, dear participants, uh, it was my great pleasure to join this fascinating discussion that we've had today. Thanks for underlining uh, the essential elements that really determine also our direction during the times of the crisis. The importance of investing in people, the importance of investing also in social sciences that can help us understand the underlying features and the needs and necessities during the crisis. Thanks as well, underlining the importance of engaging with citizens. I was particularly uh, glad to hear that because one of my responsibilities in a Directory General for Research and Innovation is citizen engagement in our research and innovation policies. Some of you may have also followed another session during these research and innovation days where we discussed citizen engagement in our missions. And there we also had our Commissioner Gabriel, but also Vice President Schweitzer with us, who also spoke about citizen engagement as important feature of uh, really uh, the, the Conference on the Future of Europe. But what we are doing already is showcasing citizen engagement in research and innovation missions. But this is something which will be the underlying feature for the whole program, for the next program, Horizon Europe. And we'd really like to showcase it also for other policy areas. Let, let me also thank you for showcasing uh, of evidence-based policy making. Your discussion illustrates how research results can help 
policymakers to develop discussions, to develop actions, and really consider different contexts, different cultures, visions, problems, and needs for Europe in and out of crisis. How Europe will act now will determine what Europe will be in the future. And you have contributed immensely today by delivering evidence for informed policy making. Many thanks for interesting discussions here. Many thanks for your projects and hope to see you all soon. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank again our wonderful experts. Thank again the Deputy, uh, sorry, the Deputy Director General for Research and Innovation. And again, wish you a wonderful week ahead. And I've just realized it's nearly the weekend. So have a lovely one.